ASMR to start beautiful. it. That's beautiful <laughs> ASMR. That's be- I think that's the perfect way to start an- any episode. Just, Always. just indiscriminate, just jiggly mouth sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's ever a statement that's ever been said that's made me squirm that bad jiggly mouth sounds good it's better look it's better than moist at least oh no (laughs) i don't think so (laughs) yeah well hello friends family and everyone in between welcome to uh the jiggly mouth sounds seminar uh no we're welcome to the uh the feel good podcast where we talk to our heroes about uh, the good that they're putting into the world and the things that make them feel good. As always, I'm your Phil co-host, Byron Filler. With me, as always, is... Mr. Yeah. Foley Artist, the good co-host, <laughs> Mike Osgood. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Good to oh, see everybody. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Good to hear everybody. We, we, we're we very excited about our guest today. We kind of just want to uh, kind of jump into all of this because we're talking today with judy carter she is a comedian author uh teacher her new book out right now is called the new comedy bible and you might be thinking to yourself well you can't teach somebody comedy well Au contraire. You can mathematically calculate comedy as we It's insane. (laughs) It's literally insane. It's one of the more, let's say, loose conversations that we've had uh, in which we learned a lot. And uh, Judy is, she is Judy. And we love her to death. And it was a blast chatting with her. And we really hope that you guys enjoy this conversation too. FYI, there's language surprise yes. <laughs> uh, but just be on the lookout for that if that is triggering to you at all but it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a blast and you will hopefully leave listening to this episode at least 12.7 percent funnier absolutely but i think i think we should let judy she'll absolutely speak for herself she has no problem doing that no so problem let, at all let's none just get into it <laughs> I'm trying new sounds. <laughs> Let's go, dear. Welcome back, everyone, from the little dance break here. Come and get yourselves tucked in, or if you're if you're driving, keep on driving. Don't stop on our keep account. Keep that seatbelt on, please. We are here today with the very talented, the very funny, probably the funniest person we've had on the podcast she's an author comedian just (laughs) extraordinary person judy carter everyone hey i gotta tell you thank you so much but it's not a good intro when you say the funniest person because immediately all your listeners are well we'll be the judge of that yeah our our listeners are very nice they're very chill and great and awesome and uh, they're gonna love you but judy how is the world treating you today well you know i'm a comic and um and i'm sure do you have any comic friends you know we're pretty miserable people and um you know there's um there's no worse idea than say, you know, I'm going to have a really fun dinner party and I'm going to invite a lot of comics over. You'll have, you'll be just sitting there just going, I just want to kill myself. I just want to push a pencil through my head. Because we comics, <laughs> we do comedy because comics all, we notice all the details of life and all the things that go wrong. So what we do is we turn our problems into punchlines so as a coping skill you know pretty much pretty much that's what that's what we do so when you ask a comic how are you they will never say fine they will never say well how am i i have love handles and no, i'm loaded what do you it's think all, I it's, am? 
<laughs> no, it's always uh, a diatribe. But why don't we, because I would love to touch on that a little bit more as we get into the okay. episode. But first, before we get into all of the things that are good about you and the good that you're putting into the world and what makes you feel good, we need to acknowledge the bad uh, friends, family, and everyone in between, you know what this is. It is the moment of bad where moment we try bad. to put 60 seconds on the clock. We just, and we just don't do it. We, we just go over the time because that's how we like to complain here at the Feel Good Podcast. And we put all of our issues up into a little ball and we just, we toss them into the sun. We make them be gone. Mike, do you want to, do you want to start today? You're, you're, or do you want me to start? I, who's, who's feeling more I would passion? absolutely. I have so much passion about my moment of bad right let's, now. Let's and feel I, that. I really want Judy, I want Judy's Give me the input. Passion. I want Judy's input here too. Sure. So, sure. Here's the thing, guys. Okay. I moved to a new house in January. It's, it's beautiful. It's great. Yeah. It's that it's almost a white picket fence kind of house. It, you know, it's in the suburbs. It's life is feeling good. You come out here, life is supposed to be peachy. Life is supposed to be easy. Deers are supposed to be coming up to the door. Beer birds are supposed to be singing. Life is supposed to be good. <laughs> but okay. you wanna know what animal sucks butt and decides to destroy a lot of things and that you're not supposed to do anything to them because it's just their natural habitat and you can't, you're not supposed to deter them by whatever. Tell us that animal. I have moles in my backyard, little under the ground bastards. And I am tired of them. These little, I'm gonna curse. These little fuckers <laughs> are going underneath my grass. And now I basically have an ATV park in the back of my house and freaking <laughs> motorcycles being able to jump over these rolling green hills because I have these little furry fuckers going under, digging tunnels, and just causing all sorts of divots everywhere. And I also, this summer, put in some nice pavers in the backyard. Uh, I put in some nice little marble chips in between it this patio looks fucking great. And now these little bastards are right on the border and they want to destroy it and they want to go into it. And now I have to find everything in my power to try to deter these little shits. And I don't know what to do because everything on the internet says they're just going to come back. And I'm like, I don't want them to. So I want to take these little bastards. I want to put them into the most uncomfortable kind of mortar shell stuff it in there put a whole bunch of shit in it i want to put it in the cannon i want to launch these bastards and i want them to be gone forever be, be gone gone moles be gone moles be gone first of all as far as killing your moles by suffocating i am right now on the phone with the aspca and they are going to be coming to your house <laughs> to arrest you because uh, maybe but, you don't know, but, it's not, but it's, I am I am a member of the Mole Protection Program. Matter of fact, hey, moles, come on in. Come on. Yeah, hey, I feed hey, them hey. and I... You dropped them off at the wrong door. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to them say off a my, couple houses down, Judy. Let's give you a little perspective on this. Please. Okay, a little perspective. This is so white boy problems. I'm just, I bought a new house and oh my God, my patio with the marble oh, is being, these are so white boy problems. I'm just oh, saying, I'm just saying, put a little perspective. No, they're a hundred percent like <laughs> cis white male suburbs problem. And you want to know what? Like I admit it. I, there are, Far worse things are happening in the world. There's a hurricane in Florida. There's a bunch of shit that's happening in Iran. There's all these big things. Those are real big bads. See, now that's funny. To me, that's yeah. funny. There, uh, 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 there's nothing funnier than to to frame your problems and put them in perspective and and admit. Uh, about that and then immediately they become very funny <laughs> you know this is <laughs> that, like, there's there are so problem. many things please there's... do you feel my pain do you feel it <laughs> like on top of it's that, it's obnoxious mortgage rates went up a percent i'm hey i okay, locked in a good rate funny. on my mortgage life is fine um, but it sucks right. for everybody else but <laughs> <laughs> all right Tell well us. i 
I, I guess I don't have mortgage problems over here. I'm still paying rent. But what I can talk about, what I can complain about today, I'm going to talk about communication anxiety. Now, I feel like over the past couple of years, I have been just observing how people are kind of just having an issue with the way they communicate with each other. And I don't like this excuse that it's like, it's hard, or it's social media's problem. And I'll give people the benefit of the doubt where it's like, yes, there's so many different platforms. It's, you know, trying to correct the tone of, or like see the tone of like, you know, it's hard to see certain things across text and obviously text is a little bit more useful because you need to keep things on the record because who's going to be a stenographer versus like being on the phone where it's like sure you get the passion and you actually feel that people are there and they are actually nice but like i find people are just so afraid of just saying yes or no and it's a problem where it's just like, you know, you see people in just such a state of fear. And I just like, I, I see it and I understand it. But as the resident autist in this conversation, you've never had an excuse here, period. Talk about having to get to a point where I'm sitting here and have to say to you, like, stop being afraid of talking to anyone about anything it's your problem and no one else's let's take that anxiety about simple communication because i know you know your own language i know you know your like i know you know the dance of having a communicate we're going to take that anxiety and make it be gone and just like tell me what's on your mind because get, fuck you better believe in something you're a human being it's ah. true so you're saying people are in a state of fear and they just won't say yes, and they won't say no, and they're ambiguous. Are, are these the, pe the, the people you want to sleep with that you're talking about? Is that? I'm just trying to figure this all out. This is like they're in a state of fear, and I just, you know, anyway. Yeah, that's a problem. Hmm. But I, Judy, Judy, let's talk about your bad. What what's is your moment of bad? What's what's going on? Today? What do you need to get off oh, today, similar, tomorrow, whatever it may be? I have similar white white girl problems. I can't figure out why I need a Tesla. Oh my god! It took me two <laughs> hours to read. And how do I fucking put on a turn signal? Oh my god! I just I so this car like does everything, and and it's like a new relation. It says it's autopilot and will drive, but I I we haven't developed trust yet, so. <laughs> I'm that, driving. That takes a couple months. I go, are you gonna stop? Are you no, I don't trust you. I'm just I'm just writing this right <laughs> here. I'm just I, I I it's just so friggin' complicated. But I'm just I just get very wrapped up and fall into a Twitter hole. And I've been falling into the Twitter hole about what's happening in Iran with the Iranian women and and all over the world of um, that they're taking away rights for women, uh, reproductive rights state by state, um, control of women's, you know, bodies. And I live on the west side in L.A., very progressive, but you can't, so shallow, everybody's so shallow, nobody cares. You can't, you can't get people on the west side of L.A. to protest anything unless you convince them that they will lose weight while they march. You just have to, you know, tell them, come on, we're going to be sweating to the civil liberties and maybe you'll lose five pounds. And they go, okay. Um, it's Get just your steps it's, in, people. Yeah, everybody's got a yeah, Fitbit. It works. Yeah, so, yeah, and then it's always checking the steps and then leaving yeah. when they get 10,000. It's, it's really hard. So, anyway. Well, right. let, let's take all of this this negativity all these awful things that are are happening to these the strong powerful ladies of this world that should be ruling this world and i don't know why they're not we're going to take all that negativity we're just going to throw it into the damn sun and make it be gone be gone but also be gone with the patriarchy because that's oh yeah be gone with the, the patriarchy down yeah. and like fuck that noise <laughs> um, well, <laughs> on that note why don't we, uh, why don't we take a shift? Judy, what we're going to do here is yeah. uh, we like to start with your origin story because every superhero 
has an origin story. So we would love to know <laughs> where where did you get your start? Where did uh, and how did it how did how did it lead to here? Well, um, I grew up in a very um, dysfunctional Jewish family with so much yelling and screaming. Oh my God. It was like we had a wailing wall in our living room. And um, <laughs> my father's, you know, an alcoholic. Um, my younger sister was, you know, took drugs from a young age. My older sister, Marcia, had, um, was a quadriplegic with severe spastic cerebral palsy. She couldn't walk, she couldn't talk. Wow. My grandmother was, um, uh, had shock treatment for depression. And my mom, she was like in denial. She actually thought she was in a musical. You know, she'd wake up, there's a bright golden haze in the meadow. Good morning. And I go like, you know, what golden haze? That's your, your daughter smoking hash. And so <laughs> I had to be funny. And if you find, yeah. you'll find that most comics, their origin story is something very similar. You, you'll never find a comic at a wonderful childhood because there is something about someone who goes into the entertainment field, becomes a writer or a comic or stand-up or what have you, and they, they view it as not as a, a, a victim, but because it's so painful, maybe joking about it really helps, and we learn it was material. So my sister had severe cerebral palsy, so she was in a wheelchair, and I would tell her jokes. And I was like six years old, and I would memorize jokes from, um, my father had this book of sex jokes, so at six, and I'm memorizing these jokes. But, the, you know, things back then were very, very tame. So I, like yeah. a joke would yeah. be, like a dirty joke would be, Confucius say, squirrel who runs up women's dress not find nuts. You know, incredibly racist, like, incredibly misogynistic. It was yes. just like it was just like, and then, but my sister Marcia, um, she would scream like she, with laughter, and when she laughed, I mean, she had such a terribly miserable life, and and when she would laugh, it would be like, you know, with this huge, you know, laugh. And it would go on and on. And that's when I discover the power of humor. And mm. she was like my first audience. And she was a great audience, not just because of her laugh, but she was a captive audience. It's not like she could get away or anything. And so I, I really believe that's where I started. And, and that's where I learned the power of humor. And I also became one of the first female magicians because... I also felt, and I do believe um, that all of our creativity is, or all of our success starts with a mess, you know, that this, this journey of our life can be described from mess to success. And the things mm -hmm. that really happen in our childhood are the things that really motivate us. And I really wanted to have magical powers. When I saw a magic show, I went, wow. I want to do this. I, you know, I didn't want to saw women in half. I wanted the power to, you know, put my sister back together. And I would dream of levitating her out of her wheelchair and having this magical power to unite my family. Um, and not knowing um, that <laughs> there are no female magicians. I became the first woman to ever work the close-up gallery of the Magic Castle in Hollywood when I turned 21. Thank and you. I was literally picked up and thrown out, um, saying, you know, women don't belong here. And and that was okay because I was traveling. I did about four, um, I did two HBO comedy specials with Magic and a Showtime special. Mm -hmm. I did over 100 TV shows. And that was that. So, so every single success I have had, and I think people, if you do a deep dive into your your own history, you'll find that every single thing in your life that you have that's successful started with uh, a terrible mess. I mean, I find people who, I, I do a lot of speaking now, and I find that, like, I was speaking to clerks, bankruptcy clerks, a convention, and I asked them, how many of you have had a, you know, grew up in a mess and a chaotic childhood, and you 
you wanted to, you know, you grew up to have a job where you organize everything for people. I mean, I, I just think that um, that's how the world works. And so everything that goes wrong, yeah, it's upsetting. But throughout my life, you know, everything that's gone wrong, including COVID, has led me to something new and challenging and exciting and ex expanded my career. So um, it's just that, you know, that saying when a door closes, look for the window. And that's what I've done my entire yeah. career. Obviously, you saw very early on for yourself that like comedy was a coping mechanism for yourself. What was the point at which you said that uh, you can take you can take stand up, format it into a way that it's teachable for people and be able to share that <laughs> with them so that they can be able to do that for themselves. What happened was when my mom died, I just got down and I had been working maybe 46 weeks out of the year doing comedy clubs and I was working in Vegas. I had a contract with Caesar's Palace and I, I was so unhappy. I was just really miserable. Um, and I went, I don't want to do this. And I can't do this. I just can't. And I didn't know what to do. I, I thought, well, I'll get a job. I never in my whole life had a real job. But, you know, then I realized you need job skills, which I didn't have. I just know comedy. And so I rent an office. I went there every day just to practice. Like, what is it like when people go to work? Like, do as if. <laughs> And, and people yeah. would say, well, what do you do? And I went, nothing. And they go, oh, they thought I was in management. And so, um, <laughs> and then someone said, well, why don't you write a book? I don't know how to write. Well, I'll try. I'll write a book. The only thing I know how to do is comedy. So I'll write how I develop material and how people can look into their life and find the funny in it. And I was rejected by one agent, then another agent. Ended up 59 agents rejected it. Um, number 60 was my lucky, <laughs> lucky, I kept sending it out. And everybody who rejected it, this was my first book, um, they said, like, you can't teach comedy, you can't teach comedy. And next thing you know, Random House has published my book. Oprah Winfrey called up my publisher and wanted me on the show. And that was her first question. She interviewed me, Oprah, the goddess, holding my book next to her bosom. And everything held next to her bosom becomes very popular. So she says, I didn't know of you course, could teach people it gets how its to own be sticker funny. Too. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. What people don't realize, it's, and it's always weird to me that people go like, oh, comedy, you just get up there and you talk about yourself. That's not at all what you do. And, you know, it's just like jazz. Jazz is one of the most comp... There are so many rules when you do jazz. Or if you've taken an improv class... You know, it's yes and, you can't say mm -hmm. no, you add information, you listen. There's so many rules. And somehow people think, well, stand up, this is what I call civilians think this. They think, well, you're just <laughs> up there um, being funny. Well, you know, let me just say this. Uh, I did an HBO special with Robin Williams and, um, and we had rehearsals. Right. And mm, yeah. and he goes, OK, I'm going to stand over here and I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to walk over here. It was planned. Was he did did he have spontaneity? Of course he did. But here's here's the genius of people who uh, seem like they're just talking off the cuff is that the genius is they make it look like they're just thinking of it when if you. So many people doing open mics go, well, I'm not going to, you know, learn any of the formulas or I'm not going to learn any of the fundamental structure of how to write material. I'm just going to talk about myself. And that's called, you know, profound narcissism. And, you know, they all open up with the worst opening line ever. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Well, look, nobody gives a fuck about you. You have to care about other people. And there's certain ways to open stand up by asking a rhetorical question. How many of you? How many of you? So there's so much to learn. So these books became wildly popular. Wildly. Um, my new book, The New Comedy Bible now, 
I've, I've flown to so many countries. It's right now being translated in Mandarin for China. I just came back from Brazil where it's uh, published in Portuguese. It's in Mongolian. It's, it's, it's nice. unbelievable how most of the comics who are successful today will say, I, I think that Joe Rogan just mentioned me that, you know, started with my book. Not that you know, I'm condoning Joe Rogan, and we don't we don't see eye to eye on things. But thanks for the shout out. Um, <laughs> but thanks, you know, thanks, I'm bro. just saying I'm just saying that it's really wonderful to see, like in in my old age now, that I feel that I did make a contribution to the world. Um, I I I I did establish my legacy, and it all goes back to that moment of, you know, when I made my disabled sister, Marsha, laugh. And so now I do, I'm, I'm, I'm doing stand-up and doing corporate gigs, but she's always in the audience in my mind. I mean, she lived about, you know, 50 and she died. And she, she's always in the audience, like, like when I do it. I could have a horrible audience, a bunch of hecklers, but I'm not, I don't give a shit. I'm not doing it for them. I, I pretend she's right at the back on the right and I'll look and I'll smile at her because she's there in my mind. And that's how I get through difficult nights. Um, and and uh, that's how I do it. So so I'm I'm just really full of gratitude, I, I guess, that a book that was rejected by 59 agents ushered in an entire ushered in several generations of comics as someone who is now well versed in this you're writing the 10 commandments of comedy yeah thou shalt not steal thou shalt not <laughs> steal jokes um as you're going through and you're doing this and you're keeping your sister in mind what what can you give as a means of advice to those who are kind of, let's say, scared to get up in front of people of the newbies that are coming out there in afraid of hecklers, afraid of just bombing. What What's that one sort of golden nugget of advice that you can give to <laughs> those who are just starting out? Well, there's all sorts of ways you can get, you know, creative ways. I was scared of people not laughing, obviously. And, and and when I told my first joke, there'd be a couple people laughing. I remember I took out some money. I just said, thank you for laughing. I started to pay people. And then I went, maybe some of you like my next joke. Well, I had them in the palm of my hands. That's how we get listeners. <laughs> See, there's, there's always, there are always workarounds. But here's the thing. Here's some really good tips is like have something to say. I never come on saying like I'm gonna make people laugh. I, I'm I go on going. What am I passionate about? What's what's really and you, and here are the four words that you can ask yourself. What's hard in your life? So I'm gonna we got Mike who has a whole routine about the moles in his yard. <laughs> we got Byron who nobody wants to sleep with, <laughs> and then we have. You take the things that are upsetting in your life and you ask yourself what's hard about your life. And don't try and be funny. In the book, I encourage people to rant and rave about them. So you go hard, weird, what's weird? What's so freaking mm -hmm. stupid and what's scary? So these four words are attitude words and you can't do stand up without them. Um, they're hard, weird, scary, stupid. And comics will use those words to bounce from joke to joke. That's that's how we, we comics work. And the that's one tip. Second tip is don't do it alone. Um, I can tell when someone gets on stage and they haven't like they haven't jammed it with their comedy buddy, and it always sounds like some manifesto single spaced and then caps. You know, it's just like, oh, so tedious mm -hmm. because when you Those have the scariest somebody, comics of all though ah oh, jesus when someone's standing in front of you and you're ranting and you go this is really passionate really bad and you can see their eyes glaze over and you go oh this isn't hitting because you know what's funny to you is 
you know, not funny to everybody. And right. And 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 it could be funny. It could be funny. You could be in front of the wrong audience. I've certainly had that where it's in a very conservative crowd and I do some lefty joke and it's like uh, so now now the world is so difficult right now. So uh, I'm I don't do political humor unless I know where I am. It's going to hit. Um, so you got to kind of look at the audience and see, although there are comics like, um, you know, on Curb Your uh, Enthusiasm, Larry David. I mean, when he was working, if he found out there was like a Mormon tour, he would just do jokes about Hasidim, like nothing that nobody would understand. I mean, that was his shtick, you know, and, yeah. and, and all the comics in the back of the room would laugh and then and <laughs> the crowd would be, huh? But that was his thing, um, and certainly uh, that worked for him uh, to, to develop his brand and, and his style of humor. And I think that that takes a really long time, and you just got to get stage time. You know, now every every city from Tuscaloosa, Alabama to, uh, you know, um, to LA, I mean, there's so many comedy clubs, and and we're having a new re renaissance of comedy clubs, certainly here in Los Angeles. I think the LA Times just came out with 60 new comedy clubs. Oh my god, and, damn! Yeah, there's rooftop comedy, there's bowling alley comedy. There's like every single place is because people are really down about um, and damaged um, and and from from COVID and the yeah. pandemic, and they just want to. Go out and friggin' laugh, and and so uh, it's a great time to pick pick up my book, put together your act. Put together your act. What separates put together your act from the new comedy bible? Well, the new comedy bible has forty eight exercises in it to uh, develop material. So um, if you figure right now, you need in one minute you need three jokes. Let's just say you get three laughs a minute. So if you're heading towards, let's say, your 30-minute 30 30 minute Netflix special, so I'm doing math, it's 90, 90 laughs, right? 90 laughs, 90 jokes. Okay, so it's a numbers game. I love that you can calculate game. this. Well, three laughs a minute, 30 minutes. To get 30 yeah. minutes, 90. Okay, so let's just go. That's hard laughs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we do. I do in my book, The New Comedy Bible, you have... Um, LPM laughs per minute to see where you're at, you know? <laughs> anyway, so to get the 90 hard laughs, let's just yeah. go, how many jokes do you have to try? Well, you're lucky if one out of eight works. So let's see. So that's 90 times eight. So that means writing like 170 jokes to get a solid 30 minutes it's a numbers game it's like sales wow. like you know yeah you're gonna oh this didn't work on this one sales call i guess i'm not gonna be a salesperson it's it's like developing the habit of writing and trying writing the joke trying it out writing writing every day and trying it out and you know your morning pages you come up with something you can also, it's so great right now, it's like you could tweet them out, see if anybody, you know, likes it, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody comments on it, throw it out. You know, it's, it's we have so many ways to, to try that, yeah. Social media has become a mechanism where it's like, I feel like comedy, especially like when my, Mike and I were like growing up, I felt like even in high school, it was like you went to comedians for the, the truth about the world and it feels like you are going like social media has been able to really fill fill in that place and comics are maybe competing with that do you feel that it's more competitive for comedians uh. now because social media is able to be able to fill a lot of the uh, social zeitgeist that like that comics once had. Well, here's an issue that's going on right now. There's a lot of um, social media influencers and stars who have huge followings. They're doing um, a 30 second clip and they're getting like 44 million views on it. 
and they're getting all sorts of deals like a deal with tinder or um you know or corporate sponsorship and um money is flowing and you know and they're spending sometimes a half a million dollars on a one minute video um it's and they're spending more than studios and they're making more than any comic could possibly make Right. And they're hiring comedy writers and people like that. Um, but but here's the problem with it. They can't go live. So there's a real mm. problem with they have a lot of followers. First of all, if you have followers in social media, it doesn't mean that they're going to come out to see you. And that's been a real problem that they just don't. Their followers, it's one thing to follow someone on your phone. It's another thing to actually get out of the house pay a cover and 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 come out. So that's an issue. The other issue is that they're all bombing. Bombing like crazy in front of a live audience because most of what they do depends on editing. Right. Um, uh, so it's a real different skill set. Um, so putting together a great TikTok um, video is a certain kind or Instagram, whatever social media you're on, is a very specific skill set which is uh, dependent upon your editing ability, your ideas and executing it, um, your brand and um, you know and and your and your followers. But standing in front of an audience and working the crowd and um, knowing how to manipulate energy, how to take a dead crowd and bring them up, how to actually, I mean, here's the thing. I would say 80% of stand-up is connecting to your audience. Right. You know, and, and what we stand-ups do is we have a Rolodex in our head of all our jokes. And let's say I'm going to open with, like, some, you know, uh, women's reproductive rights. I'm going to go political. Okay. And I open. It's not hitting. I'm sliding out of there. And I'm going to go into what's up with love handles. You know, or, you know, something else. Something okay. else, but we feel that there's like, and that only happens from, um, you know, what I call ring time, stage time, you know, getting in the ring, getting on the stage, working it, working it, and you, you know, you get your spidey senses going and you, um, you know how to work a crowd where you don't know how to do that with, with TikTok. You know, you don't, I mean, if you're sustaining a TikTok video for 30 seconds, Try doing that for 30 minutes or try what I do. I do I do uh, 60 minutes and I'm able to build a show. I know where to put certain material. I know how to build it. I know how, when to walk into the audience when things aren't going well. You know, I know how to uh, do recoveries if I'm bombing. I know I just know how to do that. And you and and my way of doing it is not going to be your way of doing it. So no, for sure. I, I but a lot of people are mistaking that. I I've, I've seen a lot of people who are doing events going. I'm hiring this you know guy who's doing really funny. It's TikTok. like this influencer, and they like did a funny video. It's got millions of likes, and it's like yeah, no, because they can't do it live. No, I have been called in for, I won't mention names, but a lot of influencers who have millions and millions and millions of followers and their manager wants to put them, you know, on tour. And I, you know, I don't do that anymore because it doesn't work. It just doesn't right. work. Yeah. You know, it's different. It's a different beast. I didn't even think of the business element of it where it's like you have this person who's like, and you're right, they're probably, we, do, even as a viewer, we don't even know they are actually bombing because we're just, we're feeding off of whatever the energy is of the likes and the platform and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And their manager or somebody sees that and they're like, oh yeah, no, let, let's get them in front of people. If they can do yeah. this in front of the comment section, they can certainly do this in front of people. And that's like, no, it's an ener it is no, an energy thing. It doesn't work. There's there's a lot of comics getting a lot of work from, um, like, like in New York, uh, Jessica Kirsten uh, was an unknown comic. Um, and she uh, works with a comedy seller. And she started putting one minute, 30 second 
uh, clips up on Instagram, then she got a Netflix special. Right. Because they videotaped her working in front of a live audience. Well, kind of going from the business of things and from Mm -hmm. your intro into becoming Oprah's favorite Bible thumping uh, partner. (laughs) Um, Bible thumper. Okay, that's hysterical. From from starting off with doing comedy with your sister to where you are now and having our discussion in regards to people using comedy as that sort of outlet for a variety of the mess in their lives. Um, Do you see at any point of people using comedy as sort of that outlet, that little bit of moment too much, uh, as opposed to, is there something that you do in your life that kind of (laughs) helps you feel good? Like as putting up the facade (laughs) of things and just using the crowd as your therapy, as opposed to actually going to therapy. What what's that thing that you do that really helps you feel good? No, it's very annoying to be around someone who's always making a joke. You know, they say that comedy is tragedy plus time. And I do believe in feeling your feelings and looking them straight in the eye without joking. But there comes a point, and I've noticed this. I remember when I was at the improv, Hollywood improv, and I was dating a comic, and he broke up with me on Valentine's Day. You know, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm doing Valentine's Day without you. You know, and it was like, oh, my God. And I just was so angry, and I was stuck in anger. And I'll never forget getting up on stage and just going, oh, my God, it's fell in love with this guy who was a narcissist. I mean, I just worshiped the ground he walked over me on. <laughs> you know, and there's a big I mean, how many men uh, shout out their own name when they make love? Oh my God. We had one thing in common. We're both madly in love with him. And 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 <laughs> and I'll never forget this moment because I had been so angry and I couldn't get out of my anger loop. And Laughing with the audience, I just remember that sense of power that came with it. And every time I thought about him after that, I laughed. Mm. And I've had students who've had cancer. And they took the class while they had cancer and in chemo. And this one lady, I'll never forget her. She, you know, did jokes like, you know, hey, do you see my car in the parking lot? Lose weight now. Ask me how. <laughs> and, you know, and 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 she actually believes that laughter cured her cancer. And yes, in personal relationships, you know, obviously we're not, you know, joking, 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 you know. But. If there is, once you can laugh at a problem, it does become more manageable. And I've had, right. uh, taking my comedy classes, there's, there's, you know, the only people who aren't funny are the people who go, no, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just perfect. I just, I guess there's one problem I have. I can't seem to gain weight. Everything I eat goes right to my breast. It's just terrible. <laughs> They're not funny. You know, the first day of class, we go, come on, what, how many of you can't lose weight? Yay, woohoo! How many of you uh, are divorced? Woohoo! You know? Yeah. How many of you are, like, yeah. are ill? Woohoo! And, and comedy is, the, is transforming these things. We don't start with, if you're starting a joke with your, uh, my dick, my tits, my, you know, rise up your chakras because you're trying to be funny. And we don't try and be funny. We just are funny. We transform some, you start with something serious, you know, and uh, I like to give people like, uh, hey, let's, let's start with funerals. What's funny about funerals? Let's start with something that's inherently not funny, linoleum, you know, and a chair, you know, okay, we got a chair. What can you write about a chair? Or it's like Robin Williams' joke it just occurred to me. Like, I wonder if cheers are going, oh, no, here comes another asshole. <laughs> and that's creative. You know, when right. you take something totally not funny, that's what's exciting. What I hear you talking about is, like, it's not 
just because I I agree with you, and I remember when I was doing stand up, I experienced that myself, where it was like you're, it almost felt like you're with people, and they know, and they inherently know when you're trying to try out a bit with them because you don't have like the time to go to like a comedy <laughs> club or you're like doing something, but it's about, it's more about like reclaiming your power, like you get the satisfaction back in having. And it's not just one person, it's an audience and connecting with people to give you affirmation that what you went through was hard, weird, scary, or stupid. Like, to know that. And you say, like, so one of your keynote speeches, and you, like, you've put this up on your website, I think this is a great way to, like, segue to, like, you talk about stress is a laughing matter. So, like, what it... Yeah. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but, like, how did... Where, what was the point at which you discovered that and that was the eureka moment and it was like, All right, now I got to tell everybody about this. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I find, you know, certainly every disastrous relationship was, you know, it's, it's, it's just how we look at life. You know, you, I, you're not in a miserable marriage. It's comedy material. You know, you don't, you're not having clients from hell. They're hecklers and there's ways to handle them. And, it, and it's a way I'm of looking at that. things. You know, I'm it's absolutely a, it's, stealing that. It's, it's like, you know, your son wasn't arrested drunk on the TV show Cops. You have a relative in show business. We comics are always switching, switching the bad things to good it's not it's not good or bad we we just see it all as material and um what i found when i went into the corporate market i had no idea that there was like there wasn't there like college like a booth for who wants to be a motivational humorist um (laughs) i mean i just after i wrote my book after i was an oprah i started getting calls for that and i went what really And what I discovered was, well, you know, you have to be very clean in the corporate thing, um, and you have to have a message. And it's not comedy. Stand-up comedy is not stories. It's just like setups and payoffs, setups and payoffs, right. and it's very, very quick. But when you do a corporate speech, you have to leave them with some um, like methodology, takeaway. takeaways, yeah. right? You got the language, Mike. Takeaways. Absolutely of what what are they going to learn and that's what is the um increase in and how much you get paid we get 20 times as much as stand-up comic does even though stand-up comedy is harder so uh stand-up comic makes people laugh uh uh motivational humorous makes people laugh but leaves them with how to handle stress and right. I found three three ways three ways of doing that. And number one is make fun of yourself as a power move and a leadership tool, and how to do that. And I and and number two is how to deal with hecklers. You know how to how to how to how to do that using humor. And then number three was how to lighten up your workplace environment is to do something different, you know, make, make different kinds of choices and that's ultimate creativity. But, you know, and then I make fun of stress experts. You know, I go like the AMA says, Ooh, watch out of the symptoms of stress, excessive eating, excessive drinking, not yeah. exercising, excessive shopping. What are we talking about? This might be of a good day. It's like, let's skip the gym, chow down, get loaded, and shop. And so I just make fun of experts and stress because nobody has it really. Breathe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Click uh, your heels three pies. So I just say laugh at it, and that's really worked for me. I actually wonder how many calories you burn just with laughter. <laughs> I mean, it's... Now that's all I can think I'm of. sure there's a Harvard study that goes to show that, yeah. like... <laughs> the flexing of your abs mixed with like the amount of air exhaled, like the molecules oh, add sure. through X amount of calories that are burned per thing. Like it Hilarious. works. It's a thing. What at what point do you find these let's say like these stresses? Is there a moment or any sort of exercise that you do 
to you go through something traumatic and you then can translate it into comedy is there a way that you find that you can come and cope with this story in order to translate it into a comedic thing yeah i find it it doesn't just happen it takes it takes work you know to do that so if i'm writing material and looking at my life i mean like i say comedy is tragedy plus time I, i'm incapable of you know something just happened we all comics you know have that joke about it's, it's too soon yeah. you know someone dies it's like no too mm -hmm. soon you know everybody wants to you have you have to take that time to you know deal with emotionally what's going on because you don't want to be on stage crying about something but it, it's the challenge like how do i do it what angle am i going to take you know um yeah. how how um and and I like I say the, the advice I give is ranting about it going using the attitude words hard weird scary stupid whatever topic you're dealing with because it's not telling the story it's not like it's really having it's stand up as premise based not story based and um you know and I think that a very simple um thing that I give my corporate audiences is is when people say hello how are you say something other than fine it's like, you know, just and put in a defect. Hello, how are you? I'm losing my hair. And then go, woohoo, you know, and add woohoo. And, and it's like doing something different and it will make people laugh. And But most people don't have the, I don't want to look like an idiot. Well, that's a chance you take when you put yourself out there to be funnier. Most people just won't do it. I, I They play it safe. It's but true. But comics don't, I mean, it's something as simple as, you know, hello how are you do something other than fine and most of us like oh, i don't want to look weird that's a chance you take and that's why you know this is not for everybody i mean there's a level of empathy that comes along with it too uh yeah being able to there's that sort of vulnerability that you're able to put onto the table from the traditional hi like how are you and you can be like i'm good or you can be like you want to know what? I haven't had my second cup of coffee yet, and I'm fucking tired. <laughs> and you want to know what? You scheduled this meeting at 8:30. How dare you? But how are you? Having being able to <laughs> not that this has happened to me at all. I like turning it. I like saying I'm exhausted. Woohoo! Because then that makes your brain find something yeah. positive. So if you do something negative, it's complaining, oh, yeah. which is fine. But to make it funny is you woohoo the complaining. You know, and then you find some uh, justification. For, I got love handles. Woohoo! You know, I'm on that cruise. I almost fell over. And they go, thank God for those love handles. Saved my life. And, <laughs> and, 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 and so that's, you know, that's how that all works. You know, like when if someone heckles you, just like, oh, Judy, have you gained weight? Oh, my God, I have. Woohoo! Thanks, Thanks for noticing. For noticing. <laughs> so it's it's like. It's that constant turning it to doing the unexpected, like, like you know, congratulating yourself for doing something bad. It's um, counterintuitive thinking, yeah. I think. I love it. I love that idea because that it is really about, you know, t like it, it feels like and what you're going through with people is you're, you're teaching them to build something for themselves and rather than sitting there and like focusing on what it can be negative it's mm -hmm. like well how can you use that and then you have so, like especially if you're like on a zoom call with someone where it's just you, you know you're looking through a webcam it's exhausting and all you can see yeah all you can see is this and suddenly you're activating your brain and their brain and now you're working together to communicate um yes bring in that full circle uh <laughs> oh god so, here's my here we go again so we're we're kind of wrapping up here judy i thank you so much for talking with us today and and making us laugh i feel i actually do legitimately feel so much better now um <laughs> oh, <I'm glad. laughs> what i what i would love to know what the beautiful people who are listening and watching would love to know is what is your future good? Where can people find you? What are you excited oh, okay. about that's coming up? Oh, I'm excited about so many things. But pretty much what I'm doing now is every Tuesday at noon Pacific time 
on Instagram, I do an Instagram live where I coach people because I get so many emails about, can you tell me if I'm funny? Can you look at this video? Can, so I, and, and I decided, you know, I didn't, I'm not running my workshop anymore, but I decided that I would just go on Insta live and whoever shows up, we've had some interesting people show up. We had a comic who was a mute and told jokes through a co his computer. It's like, really? <laughs> it's just really interesting. Nice. People from all over the world show up. That's, super, and, that's so cool. And people meet each other and it's very cool. And I feel the best way to really learn how to do it is to watch me coach somebody. And because I'm an idiot savant with writing jokes. So I like doing that. And then I'm going back to my roots now. I haven't done an open mic forever and I'm going to do one next week. And I'm just having I'm I'm having a really, really good time now with my life. Um, and um that's that's pretty much it. I do corporate gigs. I'm doing some open mics because that's where I can be free. And Instagram, I'm Judy Carter Comedy, and and I I I just it's it's so great to connect with the readers of my book, see how what they're developing, you know, with the new comedy bible because the other one was very old, like Bill Cosby, what a legend and great guy. <laughs> yeah. and so I had yeah. to write the I new. I think I blocked that so. out of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's what I'm doing. Amazing. Judy, thank you so much for being here with us. It was an absolute pleasure to chat and laugh with you today. And uh, mm. thank you, yes. guys. Thank, thank you so you, much. Judy. We dive back in, everybody. That was such a great little conversation with Judy Carter and thank her you, Judy. hilarity. Thank you so much for sliding us some time in your super duper busy schedule we super yes. appreciate it and you taught us a lot yes. but i want to hear from you byron what did you learn something that i learned that like really stuck out to me because i think i i you know i've read i've read the comedy bible myself i did stand up for several years and it was because of judy and the work that she does and the thing that i learned then that i like i feel like i keep relearning is like you know we we were talking to judy about you know we kind of started off with well you can't be funny all the time that can be like really annoying and like more global context but i think it was really helpful to see that like what she was talking about and what she was teaching was um putting the power of purpose into your life giving your life a kind of punchline and learning to train your mind to reframe the way that you think of your life so that you can give it purpose and that for her being able to teach comedy is a mechanism for that and i ident like i identified with that 100 percent because it at least for me in terms of my own personal development i can tell you like i went from non-verbal like very little social skills to being able to like wisecrack at a party in the span of six months and nice. it's so like and i was like 17 when this happened but like i bring that up more as an example to just show that it's like when you can spend time like so much of what we do in our lives is about the little habits that we don't recognize that we're doing and sometimes like just making a left turn is as simple can be the very simple thing that breaks you out of uh, of that and comedy is so just laughter is so powerful and being able to shock your system and just kind of give it like a nice cleanse to be able to do that but i think the other thing i want to point out is like the poignance of her teaching comedy and why that's so powerful because you know, when you spend, I think it's when you spend so much time having a conversation with how to 
uplift yourself rather than like trying to make a career out of like making people laugh and deconstructing things you're spending more time with figuring out how to empower people and empower yourself rather than you know just trying to scrape by and make a buck and that's what made it so interesting for me is like i think it's perspective definitely yeah yeah that basically leads into my takeaway from our chat with judy what were you feeling i mean it's perspective as well it's learning to and continuing to learn to read the room uh like whether for me and my work that i do i chat with a wide variety of different personalities and constantly having to in a way like code switch while also trying to find that way to stay authentic as possible um because People like people that they like, but also, you know, that when you're going into the South, you might not want to talk about this. Or if you're going into Northwest, you probably shouldn't be talking about Tex-Mex food. Like there's a bunch of different things that you should just keep an eye on as you're going through with conversations and also learning too of whenever you're in chats with friends or family or anything there, knowing what will be a hit and knowing what won't. Um, and that's something that for me, I've always been trying to work on. I'm going to emphasize <laughs> working on and, you know, it's a, it's an ever lasting education that I'm going to be doing. And I hope that, you know, as time goes on, it's good to know that even professional comedians are still going and learning and seeing, um, but you know, read the room, see what works, what doesn't and change it up. You don't have to do the same thing every time. So that's what I took away. I mean, when in doubt, there is no shame in throwing shit at a wall and seeing if it sticks, you know, like, you know, I thought it was can, supposed to be spaghetti noodles, do. but if you want to throw <laughs> shit at a wall too, like you can go primal, whatever I works mean, for you, Byron. I, honestly, I, I never thought about spaghetti. How, how shitty of that is that I never heard about spaghetti. You've never heard the term throwing noodles at a wall and seeing what sticks. It's always been shit. You know who my father is. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we learn something new every day. Uh, on that mm-hmm. note, um, please give Ju- Judy is amazing. If you want to learn more about her or you, if you would like to learn stand up comedy and you'd like to get some more of the same advice that we were hearing from her today, the new comedy Bible is out wherever you get your books. Go to... It's in Brazil. Amazon. It's in Brazil. If you're in Brazil, soon it's going to be in China. It's gonna, like... It's I, here. It's there. Yeah. It's every fucking it's every- way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's all over the place. And also, too, if you want to learn from the master herself, she is hosting instagram live sessions every tuesday you can find her on instagram at judy carter comedy so please feel free to go give her a follow tell her that the two feel good good looking gentlemen sent you and uh, if you would like to learn more about her corporate gigs speaking speaking opportunities all like anything else that we haven't mentioned judycarter.com i mean easy peasy easy peasy lemon squeezy we're gonna catch y'all on the, the flip, flip the flop, flop the flip the flop the, flop, the, flip, the floops flop, the flips flips, the dips flip the chips bap, the, 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 the